So the, paper, the stuff I'm going to talk to you about today arises out of the English Landscapes and Identities Project, which you will have heard Tyler talking about yesterday, those of you who are here. Um, Inglade, which as we call it, ran from 2011 till last Christmas. Um, technically finished, but we've still got the publications to finish off, basically. Um, I've put various links up on there. The WordPress one is our blog, which we probably won't really be updating much from now on, but exists. The second one down where it says Inglade Arch Ox Ak Uck is our kind of web app where you can explore some of our data. And then the other one's obviously a Twitter and email, blah, blah. Uh, so the paper I'm going to give today is based on this archaeological journal paper um, that was published end of last year, but now has a 2017 date because it's finally come out on paper. Um, so if you want to know any more about this in detail, then you can always have a look at that. Um, and I'll put the link up again at the end. So basically, the starting point for this particular presentation was uh, I was having a conversation with the boss, Chris Cosden, and he asked me whether we could do anything about population. And I'm like, oh, I don't think so, but I'll have a think. <laughs> um, based on all of our data. Um, and in the end, I came up with this model that me and Chris were quite happy with. The other members of the team were less happy with. So we published it as kind of a dialogue paper. So, to, so like me and Chris present the models and then the other three, the three um, other postdocs all kind of critique the model from the different period perspectives that they come from. It's quite good fun, trust me. <laughs> So the main Inglay data set uh, consists of over 900,000 records. I know Tyler said a million yesterday, but that's only by adding up various other things. So I like to say 900,000 uh, of English archaeology from the Bronze Age to basically the Norman Conquest in AD 1066. Although we set our end date to 1086 to ref reflect the Doomsday Book. Um, plus we also got all the kind of uncertainly dated things as well and undated things. Um, so there's various different things built into that data set, but it's primarily records of sites or monuments, whatever you want to call them, and also find spots from the Portable Antiquity Scheme. But the, the one, not the one big problem, but one of the big problems with the data set is that it's of quite low temporal resolution in that most things just say Bronze Age, Iron Age, whatever, rather than even saying Late Bronze Age, you know. Um, and England itself obviously didn't exist during our time period. Well, it existed, but it wasn't a thing separate from Wales and Scotland. But it's kind of a convenient analytical unit that we had to... Because you have to draw the line somewhere, and if you didn't, then it would just have been crazy. So, that's a lot of dots. <laughs> so basically what we have here is a lot of points, each of which represents some kind of archaeological record. Um, and we needed to somehow get to grips with all of this complexity. Um, it's very complicated. Um, if it was a Facebook status, relationship status. Um, so we started by collating by one kilometer grid square and used a simplified set of about 120 monument types by broad period in order to remove all the various overlaps that existed between all these different data sets because you'd have a site that might be represented in the, the historic environment record but also in what's labeled as AMI which is the national record of the historic environment which is the one that historic England maintained until very recently uh, but is now phasing out. Um, so there's this problem that there's all these sites. Sites are often represented in more than one record and we had no way of working out those relationships other than using a very coarse spatial grid, well not very coarse, but coarse spatial grid and just saying, you know, there are villas or there aren't villas, or there's one villa or there's no villa, whatever, in each square. Which then simplifies making maps on this sort of scale quite easily, uh, quite well. So you can query by period and these 120-ish types. So the resolution of the data is thus reduced, but you don't, you can't really tell the difference on the scale of all of England. And we also did that for finds types, but that's not really relevant. To this paper. So to try and get an initial grip on this complexity I made a series of 
kernel density estimate surfaces using the central points of all those one kilometer squares. Um, so kernel density is like, for those who don't know, which I'm sure most of you do, it's basically a, a point density map, but you set a, an area of interest, which in this case was 10 kilometers, which kind of defines how big the clusters are that you see, basically. And I used 10 kilometers because it was cartographically convenient because it produces patterns that look quite realistic at a sort of England wide scale. And for the population for the tool, um, so not population as in people, but the values that you attach to each point, I used the number of different types of site per period per one by one kilometer square. Um, for the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, uh, there's also stuff that's just dated prehistoric. So that was split between those on an even basis, 50-50 each. And basically the end result is a, a picture of the density of evidence complexity, evidence complexity, yeah, for each period in the Inglade data set. I'm not gonna bother showing you the Bronze Age one today because that's not really relevant to the Roman uh, topic of this conference. Um, but this map is the Iron Age result. And I've mapped it as uh, what we call, what you call Z scores. So basically you uh, subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. Yeah. And then the variation on the map is shown as the red values are above average and the blue values are below average. And it makes it easier to get a sense of kind of the relative variation within the data set and between the data sets. Um, and the obvious thing we can say here for the Iron Age is the eastern half of the country is showing a lot more activity than the western half. So if we move on to the Roman period, this east-west distinction becomes even clearer. There's even less going on in the west, um, which is quite interesting, on a, on a relative basis. And uh, the actual values if i'd done this with the the original the, the core values from the surface would be much higher for the roman period than the iron age period but i'm more interested in looking at the relative differences through each period um and th there are some things you can see like the in the west the only things you really see are the big towns or the legionary fortress there or these all tend to be military things up here obviously this is hadrian's wall um yeah And then when we move on to the post-Roman, the early medieval period, you see quite a relatively different pattern in that it's kind of split into two zones. So there's kind of a, a slightly less high value eastern zone. And then down in the southwest, there's another zone that kind of starts popping out. Um, so I would say overall, the Iron Age and Roman patterns look similar, but with a wider spread of the denser activity in the Roman period. But the early medieval period looks a bit different but still with this quiet kind of north of England and West Midlands. So what does all of this mean? Um, I made these maps to start thinking about population density, but the causation patterns behind them are much more complex. So, uh, so one issue is the effects of patterns of modern archeological field work and reconnaissance. <coughs> Uh, as a team, or particularly me, <laughs> we like to think of this using the term affordance um, because this gives a kind of positive spin to the relationship. But other people might prefer <laughs> taphonomy, sample bias, whatever you want to call it. I don't really mind. Um, but I, I like to conceive it using that term because it kind of implies that these things are creating opportunities rather than problems because I don't really want to say that commercial archaeology is a problem because it clearly isn't. Um, it's a good thing. Uh, so one very important affordance uh, for English archaeology is the possibility or the potential for un finding sites through aerial survey, which is what this map shows. So obviously it's a model, so it's not perfect, but um, the black areas basically are areas that are obscured by buildings or water bodies or uh, unhelpful soils or peat, alluvium, that sort of thing. And basically in those areas, it's very hard to see anything from the air other than buildings. <laughs> uh, the yellow areas then are areas that are arable 
on reasonably favourable soils, so you might see crop marks on those. And the green areas are areas that are pasture, um, where you could see earthworks or maybe parch marks in very dry years. So basically, if you're looking at this model, the way you would interpret it is the yellow areas are the areas where you're most likely to find things through aerial survey. The green areas, less likely but still possible. And the black areas, it's going to be very hard or even impossible in a lot of cases. And this is important because probably <coughs> at least half the sites in the English archaeological record have at least have either been discovered or at least investigated through aerial photography, probably even more. Um, <coughs> the other main way in which sites enter the English archaeological record is through excavation, obviously. Things like geophysics, frankly, aren't that significant yet as an original source for most sites because generally speaking, it still takes place on places where people knew there was something there or suspected there was something there. Um, and even though people do do huge areas of geophysics these days, as percentages of the country, it's still very small. Um, so we're looking at aerial photography and excavation. Excavation, since developer funding came in in 1990, is no longer primarily driven by archaeological research questions, but by where people are digging gravel pits, building buildings, housing estates, that sort of thing, which then introduces this different kind of sample bias into the record. Um, the problem with trying to model this, this affordance, however you want to call it, is that collating planning data for England is very difficult because it's all done by counties, or not counties, districts, and then the districts change, and then it's some different areas that will be done by a county for a while and then not, and then the data won't even be available for certain years. Um, so planning statistics isn't really a very helpful way. So they, in the end, my compromise was I used um, Historic England's uh, National Record of the Historic Environment uh, Excavation Index, um, but I used, so I'm using excavation to map the, afford, the possibility of people, things being found using excavation, but I tried to, to um, make this more realistic by including excavations that discovered things of all time periods or which didn't discover anything whatsoever. So rather than, because if I'd just done it for say the Roman period, then it's not gonna be very helpful because it's already biased by just being Roman stuff. And then, using the proportions of records that um, came from aerial photography and came from excavation, I constructed this composite model. And basically on this model, the blue areas are areas where the opportunities to discover archaeology are quite limited or low, or it's harder. Uh, the kind of cyan through to yellow areas, there's more opportunity and it's getting easier, and the red areas, which or the orangey areas, are the areas where, you know, you're falling over the stuff. Um, and there's quite there are some areas of the country where it's very obvious that the possibilities of discovering archaeological material are quite limited, particularly in the northwest. So this must affect our density models that we saw earlier to some degree. Uh, another element that affects those models is uh, the nature of archaeological deposition in the different regions. In particular, uh, pottery. It remains the most common and cheapest and easiest way to date archaeological sites of the later prehistoric Roman and early medieval periods. Um, but there are large areas of the country that were either aceramic or saw very low levels of use. Um, and as such, it's easier to date sites in areas of the country that have more pottery around. So the model here is for later prehistoric pottery. And again, blue is low numbers of sherds, red is high. It's based entirely upon this uh, data set that's listed at the top right, Earl et al, which is on the ADS, but was collected in the 1990s, so is quite out of date. But it's the only comprehensive source that's available, and I didn't have the time to go out and gather pottery records myself because that would take a long time. And again, so again, we see the same pattern of there being much more pottery being used in the later prehistoric period in the southeastern half of the country. Although, again, this model is also influenced by the other one because you need to be digging to find pots. Uh, for the Roman period, this model is a little bit different because 
of the nature of the, the only data set that really exists, which is a website maintained by a guy called Paul Tyers, called Potsherd. Um, and he makes maps of different wear types across the country. So this map is showing the variety of Roman pottery across the country, um, rather than the numbers of sherds. So the redder areas, there are more wares being deposited, and the blue areas, there are very few. Um, and again, this is a relatively old data set. Um, I'm not quite sure what period it, it's updated to. His maps generally said 2004 on them. The website itself says 2014. So, but it's probably about 10 years out of date, I would think. Uh, and we can see that in the Roman period, pottery seems to have been more widely used than in the uh, Iron Age. But again, with less stuff in the north, away from the military sites and a few big towns. Uh, making a model of early medieval pottery <laughs> is really hard because there's never been any comprehensive data set ever made, um, at least that we could find and that anyone could tell us about. Um, and there's also this split in the early medieval period between people who are interested in the earlier pottery that's hand, hand raised and the later pottery that's when wheel throwing pottery comes back in. Um, so you've got people like Paul Blinkhorn who do who are really who really like Ipswich Ware, which is one of the wheel, which is the first wheel thrown one to come back, and then other people, not many of them, <laughs> like the crumbly early stuff. Um, <laughs> so the model that I built this time is based on a whole variety of data sets. I also built in fifth and sixth century cemeteries because they work as quite a good proxy for the earlier pottery industries because most of those contain pots. And the kind of the large pale areas you see on this are because I included this Vince data set, which is basically just big blobs that he drew on the map saying this is where people use this and this is where people use that. But it felt kind of important to include it, even though it makes the model look quite unrealistic. And again, we see this pattern of there being far more pottery use in the east than in the west. So when we compare these things sort of using very basic statistics, uh, I basically sampled all of those uh, evidence density models by 10 kilometers square and all of the pottery and affordance models by 10 per kilometer square. And then these are X, Y plots of those various things with least square regression lines added. And basically we show a degree of correlation with both affordance and pottery supply in all, of, in all three of the models. Uh, the strongest correlation is this one between uh, the monument affordance model and the Roman period model of uh, evidence density. And from this we can conclude that the supply of pottery affecting ease of dating and patterns of modern fieldwork do have an effect on the density of evidence for each period, but they don't explain everything. Which is obviously good because it means that the models do have a partial basis in patterns of past practice and it's not just all caused by where people are digging. So the question then is what else could be having an effect? One obvious possibility uh, and the starting point for the exercise in fact is variation in population density. This is also tied in with how settled people were and how tied into economic networks of exchange. At the end of our period, the Doomsday Survey can be used to model population density in England in the late 11th century. It's an imperfect model, but all models are imperfect, uh, due to the inconsistent recording of slaves and recording at the level of households rather than people. But again, if we just look at this as being free people and look at it as z-scores again, so don't worry about the actual numbers of people, then it, uses, then it forms quite a nice uh, model for comparison against the other models that I built. And we can see uh, this one down in the bottom right is that early medieval density model again. And there are some quite clear similarities, particularly in this sort of area. But then there are also significant differences in that my model has lots of stuff going on in Cornwall, whereas uh, the doomsday people didn't see a lot going on in Cornwall. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. And uh, this kind of Gloucestershire area also jumps out as being different. And some of that's justifiable on historical grounds because one imagines that the surveyors 
had more trouble getting into Cornwall than they did into other areas because it's a bit more remote. So if we return to the Roman model, as that's our period of interest, we put on the major roads and towns over the top. Uh, it's very clear that most of the large towns see concentrations of evidence around them. Um, and it's also clear that there are evidence concentrations close to roads. Some of these, notably the one around Oxford, which is down here, uh, are likely more to be due to fieldwork patterns than due because of all the large gravel pits that run along the Thames in that area, than due to actual difference, the actual true super density in the past. Um, so basically my final conclusion is that everything's complicated <laughs> and interrelated. It's possible to get some sense of the differences, perhaps in past relative population density on a very broad scale and a very coarse temporal resolution, but it's not a perfect correlation. And you know how settled people were also had an effect, but must have, but there must have been more people in the southeast, south and east of England in the Roman period and in the other two periods as well than in the north and west. So uh, that's basically it. I just threw in one extra little slide just for fun because you're gonna, we're talking about transportation next. Um, this is quite, well, I like this. <laughs> Basically, another way of analyzing that data, instead of doing a kernel density estimate, I treated it as a cost surface. So where proximity to things uh, acquires a lower cost than, uh, the further away you are from a thing, you have a higher travel cost. So the assumption is that people want to travel through areas where there are more people th around and more things going on. And uh, if you do like a cumulative cost surface, like everywhere to everywhere, where you're dropping loads of points on and doing a cost surface from each point, and add them all up. And again, turn the thing into Z scores. You get this quite nice model of areas where, it's another way basically of visualizing the same data set, but you begin to see some of these routes coming out. Like there's a nice one along there that's not represented by road. Most of them are represented by roads and the roads are in the model. So that's not a surprise. Um, but I just thought I'd throw it in because it's fun. Anyway, thank you to everyone who gave us data. And uh, yeah, if you want to read more about this in a slightly more coherent fashion, uh, check out our paper, which I have one copy of. <laughs>